Hi, I'm Steven. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Brucia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives. Our guest today is Bilal Saab, who is a research analyst with the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Mr. Saab. Thank you, John. Thank you for joining us today. And what we're going to do is talk a little bit about some of your main areas of interest, uh, which include the Middle East, broadly speaking, and specifically the area of terrorism and counterterrorism studies, and even more specifically, the Al Qaeda organization. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your principal interests in this area? What, what led you to focus on these topics, and what are you immersed in today in terms of research? Sure. Uh, I think my interest is profoundly informed by my life experience. You know, John, I am Lebanese. I come from the Levant, which is arguably the most violent and conflict-prone uh, sub-region in the Middle East. Uh, I have witnessed uh, two, uh, I've witnessed a long civil war and I understood uh, the primacy of human security and I've always had a literary fashion, scholarly uh, passion, sorry, uh, for international relations and I've always wanted to combine that passion with practical work to uh, advance uh, regional security and regional stability. Um, and uh, this is why I am today in Washington. I, I'm very happy to be at Brookings. It's a very collegial environment. I'm fortunate to be working with the best minds on that issue. Good. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the terrorism threat today. We, we've gone through multiple anniversaries of 9-11. On each anniversary, we, we reflect on what has happened. and. Where are you right now in terms of your assessment of the terrorist threat? Um, is, is it worse than it was uh, in, in uh, 2001? Is, is it better or is it hard to make an assessment because it, it's always evolving and changing? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. You're right. It's hard to assess. and it, I think it depends on what metrics we're using and how we are defining the threat. Uh, there are two phases. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Uh, the pre-Iraq phase and the post-Iraq phase. Uh, and I think the Iraq war has changed it dramatically. And the uh, U.S. invasion of that country and occupation and the messy uh, post-war uh, uh, phase has actually uh, radically changed the, uh, the threat. We are facing today a much more um, complex, uh, diffuse uh, threat uh, the Al-Qaeda organization uh, as, as, if you want to call it, Al-Qaeda Central, which is comprised of the uh, leadership in Pakistan, Afghanistan, is uh, still there and it's alive. Uh, some people would argue that it is on the march. Uh, other people would argue that it is merely in a process of transformation. Um, I think the truth is uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, but they are very much still alive. Um, none of the senior leaders has been uh, captured or arrested or killed. Uh, they still have a strong interest and determination to attack the United States and the West. Um, they are planning on uh, doing so, according at least to international uh, uh, intelligence agencies' assessments and their judgments. Um, now, the Iraq War has changed it in, in, a, in a way that it, it opened new doors for al-Qaeda uh, uh, um, uh, in the Middle East. And um, if you remember in 2003, this was an organization that was on the ropes. It was really uh, in a very difficult situation. The Iraq War changed that. And uh, now we're having more recruits, more angry Muslim uh, young people who, um, who want to join the Jihad. And um, it is becoming truly a global uh, terrorist movement. 
uh, and Al-Qaeda relies on those affiliates. It relies on those uh, sympathizers to basically fulfill its uh, uh, objectives. So bottom line, it is a more complex, it is a more uh, diffuse uh, threat, and it is in no way less dangerous than, uh, than it was after 9-11. Well, let's talk a little bit about al-Qaeda's presence in Iraq, and I think this is an issue that many people still do not understand to this day. As you said, in, before the intervention, al-Qaeda was in relatively bad shape. Its presence in Iraq was certainly minimal, and then we have the intervention, and all of a sudden, this is like a, a shot in the arm for the, for the organization. Uh, but, but explain why it was able to have such influence so quickly in the um, Iraq theater? Well, um, again, the, the, the invasion itself gave, uh, at least that's how the Al-Qaeda narrative would put it, how the Al-Qaeda leaders themselves would put it, gave tangible evidence for people in the Middle East who are alienated, who are unemployed, who are angry with U.S. policy in the region, not with the U.S. people above with U.S. policy because of its failures in the region, uh, it gave them tangible evidence that the United States has imperialist designs in the Middle East. And uh, these are very proud people. They ha are very uh, 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 conscious about their history and about their role in the region. So uh, some people have chosen resistance. Uh, some people have chosen uh, to join the jihad. Um, and this is why al-Qaeda has found new recruits. Uh, they have lured them, obviously. It's been a very complex radicalization process. And Iraq has, w with the works of the uh, late al-Qaeda leader in Iraq, um, Zarqawi, he had, he had a very devilish and evil uh, plan that actually worked uh, until his death, which is to in ignite this uh, sectarian violence in Iraq between uh, Sunnis and Shia. Uh, you can argue that it's been a historical divide. Uh, I would argue, uh, along with a number of colleagues of mine, that the divide itself was less sectarian and more political. But w with, the, uh, with the bombings that he perpetrated, if you remember in the Holy Shia Shrine in Iraq, with, with the atrocious uh, uh, killings and murders uh, perpetrated against Shias, he was able to do what no uh, uh, terrorist or what no, uh, even Saddam Hussein was able to do uh, 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 when he was uh, a ruler of Iraq, which is again to ignite a, some sort of a civil war between Sunnis and Shia. And that civil war basically gave new uh, life to uh, jihadists uh, and again gave the organization new recruits. What are we talking about in terms of numbers? Because I think th there was a sense among many people back at the time of 9-11 that this was an organization that had perhaps thousands of members and there was this fear that there would be a, a, you know, an al-Qaeda related terrorist behind every yeah. wall, under every stone, and, and, and then after the intervention in Afghanistan and so many were, were killed, others were dispersed, I think some of those fears went away. Uh, but w what are we talking about in terms of core members and also in terms of sympathizers? Sure. Uh, you know, the size has been always a controversial issue of Al-Qaeda. I can, I can look at you and say this is an organization that is no more than 200 to 300 members as far as core Al-Qaeda leaders. Now, again, if you go back to the issue of how you want to define the problem, if you want to define it in terms of this is an organization that we have to basically decapitate and, and, and uh, uh, kill the core members because they're the ones who inspire these young people uh, uh, to join the jihad. That is one aspect of the problem. And these leaders, like I told you, they're, they're in uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Now, the other more challenging problem uh, is the uh, sympathizers. And I can look at you and tell you that there are thousands of people who want to join the jihad and who uh, uh, have been well, persuaded in one way or another to join the jihad. And uh, this is the more challenging problem. This is a problem uh, that involves persuading these people to basically not join the jihad, to give them opportunities, to give them hope, um, to give them employment uh, and, and uh, reasons to, to believe that it is only against their interest to, to, to uh, uh, join uh, the jihad. So it, it's, it's, it's a two-part, you know, the 200, 300 members, uh, core of al-Qaeda, and then the sympathizers, who are 
growing and growing because of despair in the Middle East, because of uh, uh, lack of hope. And that's a big, big problem. And in, in terms of where these uh, Al-Qaeda operatives are, are based, I, I know at one time we had a big concentration of them in Afghanistan and the surrounding area. Then came the intervention and they were dispersed. And they didn't just disperse in the region. Some people seem to think, oh, they just went across the border into Pakistan. A lot of them did, but a lot of them went elsewhere. Exactly. They, went, they went to Europe. They went to Africa. They went to ver various parts of other parts of Asia. And what is happening now? Are, are, are there more al-Qaeda operatives in more countries than ever before based on available uh, you know, open sources of, uh, of information? Right. Again, this is a controversial issue, and uh, the size is, is, is always a difficult uh, uh, thing to measure. But you're right, not all of them actually relocated to Pakistan. Uh, a good number of them have because of the safe haven that they enjoy in uh, uh, Pakistan. Uh, and the tribal areas have been, uh, if you would argue, an ideal location for them to uh, uh, have that safe haven. But Iraq, Iraq is a, is a big relocation uh, for them. Um, the jihad all of a sudden became a, a central front. Uh, Iraq became a central front for, uh, for uh, uh, the jihadists. Uh, they have also relocated to Algeria. They have relocated to Yemen. They have also, from Iraq, relocated to neighboring countries, uh, basically Lebanon. Uh, the Palestinian territories recently, uh, you were hearing increasingly that uh, Al-Qaeda has been trying to establish some sort of a presence in Gaza. Uh, now, how credible is that presence, how dangerous it is, it is uh, remains to be seen. Um, Syria, most recently we heard the terrorist attack. You know, Syria is, is uh, as uh, the regime would like to claim, is one of the safest places in the Middle East. Now, for the wrong reasons, but um, now, uh, we, we don't know who perpetrated it, but the fingers can be uh, already pointed uh, at uh, Islamic extremists. But as you said, that's not the kind of thing that is supposed to happen under a regime that maintains such a Well, there are limits grip. to, uh, uh, you know, how much uh, government capacity there is in, in, in uh, Damascus. Uh, yes, it is a very close regime. The Syrian intelligence services are notorious for their uh, 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 competence. Uh, but again, there's a limit to what they can do. And the, uh, uh, if you remember, the Syrians have been, I would say, very generous with their uh, policy towards the Iraqi refugees. And, and a number of uh, officials, uh, intelligence officials, have argued that there's going to be a risk uh, with that policy. And uh, uh, when you allow, uh, when you invite so many Iraqi refugees, I think Syria is really on very high on that list of uh, accepting uh, uh, Iraqi refugees. When you allow uh, that massive transfer of human beings, you're going to end up with a few bad guys. A few, how many, I don't know. But uh, And uh, r the most recent evidence is that this is a, uh, uh, a car, uh, the 200 kilogram uh, bomb that was detonated in that car. It was uh, actually bought in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I wouldn't find it unreasonable to assume that uh, uh, it was perpetrated by members who were in Iraq who cross the borders into Syria with Syrian acquiescence or uh, uh, acceptance. And uh, this is what you're seeing, the, 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 the consequences of the Iraqi fallout. And you've seen it also in Lebanon. What about cases where the hand of al-Qaeda is not as readily noticeable? And I'm thinking specifically about Pakistan, because there has been this presence in Pakistan ever since they were dispersed from Afghanistan. and there are connections through Pakistan to many parts of the world. Are people being inspired in large numbers by al-Qaeda and then going out and doing things or arranging to do things that are detrimental to the security interests of the West? Right. Th there is, there's what you call the self-starters, who are just looking for theological guidance, counseling from the leaders, uh, but who would prefer to maintain as much as possible operational in uh, independence. Uh, they definitely want to seek money from them, uh, funding, but uh, as far as planning, as far as choosing the target, they'd like to uh, uh, retain operational intent independence as much as possible because for the success of the operation, because they know the territory more than the leaders themselves, obviously. Uh, and I'm thinking of cases like Algeria, 
you know, Algeria is uh, the nationalist insurgents uh, that have been fighting the government for such a long time in Algeria, and now who have turned into this, uh, uh, who have joined basically the global insurgent uh, movement of bin Laden. This is, I can see it as right in bin Laden's playbook. This is exactly what he wanted. This is a, uh, a brutal uh, group that has been uh, uh, killing innocents for such a long time. Um, but the thing is about this group, the GSBC, uh, um, is that they have their independence. Uh, they have an independence uh, uh, as far as, again, choosing their targets and uh, 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 having uh, um, some sort of, uh, uh, again, operational independence from the uh, leaders themselves. But bin Laden is very happy with, uh, with what he has uh, accomplished in Algeria. Maybe it would be helpful if you would explain the insurgency in Algeria and how that has translated into uh, international terrorism. I know a lot of people were focused on that group in the 1990s when attacks were carried out in France and, and other places. Has Al-Qaeda's presence revitalized them in a way or were they always strong and they just were not as visible because we were paying attention yes. to other things? Well, I'm not an expert on Algeria, but I can tell you uh, from the uh, literature I've been reading and, and the officials I've been talking to on that issue is that the insurgency itself has always been a very strong insurgency. Um, and uh, this is testament to what you know it has been uh, doing for the past uh, uh, decade or so. And, uh, and it, its strength, its size has actually captured the interest of Osama bin Laden. And this is a very vital region in, in the uh, uh, African continent. Uh, uh, there is communication. Uh, the process is basically uh, either the Al-Qaeda senior leadership gets in touch with the uh, local group and uh, offers it money and, and, and uh, funding and uh, theological uh, guidance and what have you, and recruits and men and material, or it's the other way around. Uh, the local group itself basically establishing contact with Al-Qaeda and if you want to say sending them the resume uh, and saying well we are actually capable of joining the Jihad and here are, here's what we've been doing for the past decade would you accept us in the global Jihad uh, I'm not exactly sure which way it was uh, again I'm not an expert in Algeria but it is a very strong insurgency and it has definitely captured the interest of uh, bin Laden it gives him more foothold in the region when people ask you about where we are in the war against terrorism, are we safer, are we less safe, and especially when they say this in the context of the fact that there has not been a, an attack within the territory of the United States since 9-11, uh, wh what do you say? You know, this is a topic that we've been, uh, we, the members of the policy community in Washington have been discussing for such a long time and I can tell you countless reports have been written on that. Um, it is a very happy statistics that we, we have not been attacked since 9-11. But that's not by chance. That is not by chance. Well, some would argue that it has been, well, luck has played a part luck in is, that. Luck of course. Uh, yes. Now, the intelligence uh, uh, community has played a, a heroic part in that and, and they have the I can tell you that the Treasury Department has been doing wonderful work in tracking finances and uh, making it harder for the terrorists to, uh, to fund, to raise uh, uh, money. Um, and uh, there has been a war of attrition also in, in, uh, in Iraq that we have been uh, capable of, of killing a number of leaders. Uh, the leader himself, uh, Zakawi, has been uh, uh, killed. Um, a very also another happy statistic we have is that the U.S. homeland, if you want to call it a theater, uh, does not have a homegrown Islamic uh, uh, militancy problem uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them is uh, the uh, Muslim community is very well integrated into American society. Uh, they actually are m better integrated than the, than other uh, communities in, in, in the country. Uh, they are. They tend to be more upper middle class, and this is something you don't see in Europe. Um, they are not isolated, they're not living in ghettos, uh, uh, and they're very happy uh, living here and actually fortunate. They, they yeah, not to sound too cliche, but they do believe in the American dream. Uh, now, uh, does that mean that we're not going to be attacked uh, uh, in the near term or long term? I, I don't have a crystal ball. I really wish I. I, I uh, I had a good, good answer for you, but uh, 
again, like, like I told you, there's a debate going on between uh, uh, independent counterterrorism uh, experts and officials as well. Uh, a, a friend of mine, Peter Bergen, uh, who I'm sure you know, uh, argues that the uh, Al-Qaeda leadership is, is no longer capable, at least at this time, of perpetrating a, a terrorist attack of the uh, magnitude and scale of what happened in 9-11. Now, does that mean that we will never be able to do that? Or we just don't know. We've made it definitely harder for them to uh, uh, launch an attack of the scale of 9-11. Um, another, uh, 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 another very good thing that we're seeing that uh, also uh, prevents basically uh, a terrorist attack from taking place is the debate in it's, uh, itself inside the Muslim community, or I don't want to say the Muslim community, I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, radical Islamic community. There's a debate uh, going on there, and we've seen it very publicly in, in uh, reports, in, uh, in conversations between uh, uh, leaders of the communities uh, that uh, arguing that Al-Qaeda made a mistake by attacking uh, uh, the United States in uh, September 2001, that it had overreached. And this is what basically they would argue has been leading to the decline of the organization, has been leading to uh, anger in, in the Muslim community, turning against it, cooperating with the United States and Western uh, countries to uh, uh, defeat it. And these are all really uh, promising uh, signs. As, as we look to the future, uh, where do you think we should emphasize our, uh, our efforts, our resources, our capability to try to determine what's going to happen and, and, and stop it? Uh, do, do you think we're putting our resources in the right place, or are we, are we not? Pakistan, Afghanistan. Pakistan, Afghanistan. This is the central front. As, as, uh, as the Bush administration has, has uh, uh, argued uh, uh, for the past um, five years or so that the central front in the global war on terror is Iraq, uh, this is a mistaken approach. And uh, we really uh, are diverting our resources f um, from uh, uh, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, into the Iraqi theater. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, if you remember, was not in Iraq before the United States invaded. Uh, this is a very basic uh, fact, and uh, we, we, we cannot deny it. Uh, the leadership is relevant, and I would argue, uh, I would agree with my colleague uh, uh, and good friend Bruce Hoffman. The leadership matters, because the leadership inspires, and the leadership, uh, the leadership of Osama bin Laden and Ayman Zawahiri, uh, as long as they're there, they uh, inspire million, millions of people. Of, of people who want to join the jihad and um, once you decapitate them and, uh, and uh, 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 no longer offer uh, uh, the, the ideological um, baggage for, for uh, all these young recruits who are really, really disillusioned and uh, this is a long topic for another time but uh, I'm not quite sure how much they're really interested in joining the global jihad. I think it's for the lack of alternative and the lack of choices and, and again, the, the hope that they have lost. But our resources, bottom line, should be uh, focused on Pakistan, Afghanistan, and this is going to be the most important challenge and difficult uh, assignment for the next uh, president. We just don't have the right uh, 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 cooperation yet from the Pakistani government, and this is going to prove to be a very, very uh, complex issue. And is that cooperation getting better or worse, especially in light of the recent tensions between the two well, countries. What I hear, what I hear from uh, uh, discussions I have, colleagues, uh, colleagues of mine who used to serve in the, in the government, who are senior officials, that uh, the cooperation has gotten better. But, uh, um, and, you know, sometimes the press uh, tends to uh, exaggerate the uh, tensions between the Pakistani government and U.S. government. My own understanding is that uh, uh, there is cooperation, but there are limits to that cooperation because of uh, uh, government capacity. The Pakistani government uh, lacks capacity, and and uh, we have that big problem of the ISI. Uh, the ISI, uh, I don't want to say the entirety of the organization, but at least elements inside the ISI have either sympathy towards uh, radical groups in in uh, the tribal areas, or actually actively work with them. Now, whether the ISI uh, works in defiance of official government policy, we just don't know. Uh, 
some people I would uh, I, I, I talk to would argue that yes, that, 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 that they work in defiance of the ISA and that they are actually in charge. The, the, the Pakistani president is not in charge. Um, even Pervez Musharraf, he did not have uh, complete control over the ISI. Now, how do you solve that issue? Uh, this is going to be a, a very difficult task uh, 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 facing the next president. That is the, the classical issue of sovereignty. Uh, what you hear in the news uh, recently is that uh, President Bush has approved raids inside, deep inside Pakistani territory. And we have actually heard the news that there have been uh, gunfights between uh, uh, American soldiers and uh, Pakistani soldiers. Now, the Pakistani president claims that, you know, just, uh, uh, that these, these fights never happened or, or that they've been exaggerated in the press. But you clearly see, like you said, that there are tensions and, and that Pakistan is a sovereign country and it will not hesitate to defend itself. And uh, 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 this is why we really need that transparent, uh, honest, uh, 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 bilateral relationship with Pakistan in order to move forward in that issue. As you look to the future, are you optimistic or pessimistic, especially because, as again, I think too many people fail to understand, the terrorism threat today is open-ended. This is something that will go on for a generation or two at this current level of intensity. Um, but at the end of that time period, are you reasonably optimistic that we will be in a better position, yes. or is it, is it impossible to say? You know, there are two ways of thinking of this, and uh, uh, one of them is, I think it's important for us to uh, uh, define in a clear way and in a rational way how we think about victory. And this is not, uh, this is not Iwo Jima. This is not uh, conquering territory and raising the flag and saying, oh, the mission is done. This is more like dominating the battlefield. This is more about uh, uh, winning hearts and minds, and this is going to take generations. Um, now, terrorism is a big problem. Uh, the terrorism is, is something that the next pr American president is going to have to deal with because it's got massive psychological consequences. But I'm optimistic as far as global stability because this century has witnessed fewer wars than any other century. And uh, some people would argue, like John Miller would argue, that terrorism is not as, as, as consequential as people would like to see, uh, would like to believe. Uh, uh, Yes, there are spectacular attacks like 9-11, but what are the chances of that happening again? I mean, we have made mistakes uh, and we have been unprepared to deal with 9-11 and part of it resulted in 9-11. Uh, the enemy is strong, but he's not that strong. Uh, there are many weaknesses inside Al-Qaeda and we really have to capitalize on those weaknesses and try to facilitate and, and uh, 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 hasten basically the process of its uh, death because this is a failed project. Al-Qaeda is a failed project. Okay. Well, on that note, I think we'll conclude. Uh, Mr. Saab, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, John. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.